On this episode of China Unscripted, a dystopian future awaits us all if the Chinese Communist Party takes Taiwan. And to achieve that, the party is waging political warfare on Japan. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And joining us today is Professor Kerry Gershanik. He's a visiting scholar at National Zhengzhou University in Taiwan. He's an expert on the Japanese-American Security Alliance, and he's the author of the book, Political Warfare, Strategies for Combating China's Plan to Win Without Fighting. Thanks for joining us again, Gary. Hey, thanks for having me here, Chris and Shelley and Matt. Good to see you again. Aloha. Aloha. Goodbye. It means hello and goodbye. You get it? All right. Anyways, uh, let's talk about important things. Uh, so I know a big focus for you is is Japan. Um, it seems like right now Japan has a choice to either work with China, as the Chinese Communist Party likes to say, or confront China. What is in store for the future of Japan, depending on which choice it makes? Japan faces a, a rather dystopian future if it chooses to roll over before the People's Republic of China. Right now, Japan, to its great credit, is beginning to take steps and make noises, saying and doing some of the, the right and long overdue uh, things that need to be said and done. Uh, but those pertain in part to preparations for military confrontation to defend themselves better militarily. And the other aspects are sending the right political messages to say that the defense of Taiwan is the defense of Japan, no longer keeping that as close to, close hold to the chest, as we say in poker, uh, as they have in the past. They've always understood that, but they've never been bold enough to say that uh, publicly in the way that they're they're conveying those that messaging politically right now. So, well, there's there's serious and, and, and arguably uh, potentially fatal gaps in the Japan-America Security Alliance organization and capability to work together in a crisis, a combat-related crisis. Uh, there, there's important steps that Japan's taking, putting missiles and self-defense units, for example, in the Southwest Islands. But uh, an area that still needs more attention is Japan's defense against Chinese political warfare. They're, they're vulnerable. Well, before we get into that, uh, you mentioned that uh, Japan faces a dystopian future if they roll over for China. What What is at stake for Japan? Why are they making these moves about saying they're going to, uh, they would defend Taiwan if China invaded? What's at stake for Japan? What's at stake, uh, as I laid out in a paper that the uh, Center for Security Policy printed called Japan 2040 is, um, a stark assessment um, is that uh, basically Japan will be by 2040 isolated, impotent, subservient to a vengeful totalitarian China. If it does not get its act together in countering PRC political warfare a lot better than it's been able to do at this point. The problem is that while Japan can get better and working with the United States in pertaining to its military defense, if internally it's divided, if internally it's demoralized, if internally it is subverted in its ability, willingness to use that key defensive capability to make the political decisions necessary to defend itself, inevitably it will become a, what uh, the other title for the book or the, uh, the paper that was printed is uh, Haiboku Shita Nihon, and it will become a defeated Japan. Is this paper on 2040, is that operating under the assumption that China would have taken or conquered Taiwan? Yes. My paper is based on a number of sources. Uh, it's got about 120 footnotes, but one of the more important foundations for this assessment of how the uh, Indo-Asia Pacific region looks come the year 2040 is based on a uh, Center for uh, uh, Strategic and Budgetary Assessments study that was done last year. 
and it looks out to actually 2035 and says these are this, these are the nations that will become vassal states, tributary states of the People's Republic of China by then. These are the states that will be emasculated, that will be isolated. And, you, know, you can name them there, the Quad, India, Japan, um, and Australia will be cut off, isolated, and will be the whipping, whipping boys, whipping girls, however you want to, you know, whichever gender you want to choose to uh, signify them. They will be the ones that all the other nations will be beating up on as they support Beijing's political objectives in the United Nations and other international organizations, for example, and in whatever core interests uh, that, that China is claiming at the time. So Japan won't necessarily be militarily occupied. Um, quick digression here. It could be, if you're to believe uh, uh, CCP propaganda, it could be a nuclear wasteland by then because recently the CCP, through its propaganda organs, threatened to repeatedly nuke um, non-nuclear Japan if, if Japan didn't do what it wanted to regarding Taiwan. But right now, I'm not focusing on military occupation or kinetic warfare that defeats Japan. It's political warfare. China's plan to win without fighting, not without struggle, but without going to large-scale conventional um, kinetic conflict. So why would the conquest of Taiwan have such an impact on Japan? It breaks the first island chain. First island chain is the, uh, one of the, the terms that we use in regional security discussions to say this is, you know, this is the chain that we use to, to deter China, to keep it from its China dream. And it's a good thing to keep it from its China dream because that dream is basically a Sino-fascist, expansionist uh, way of taking control, becoming the regional hegemon and ultimately the global hegemon. So the first island chain is key to that. You take Taiwan and suddenly Taiwan, as I lay out in the first several pages of the paper, Taiwan then becomes the base for the People's Liberation Army ballistic submarines that fire nuclear weapons, fire nuclear missiles. It becomes the base for those aircraft that are used to subjugate, not necessarily bomb, but just intimidate the Philippines enough to make them abrogate the, the Philippine or the treaty, the mutual defense treaty with the United States. It gives China the upper hand that that it needs to get South Korea to do the same thing, to abrogate that treaty, because the impression will be the U.S. can no longer defend our allies and our friends in the region. And so ultimately, Taiwan falls, Japan becomes militarily isolated. It cannot defend its fishing fleets. It cannot defend its uh, offshore resource extraction industries. It cannot defend its own shipping and the oil, the energy that it needs shipped through the South China Sea and at just about any other line of communication or avenue of approach to Japan because China and the People's Liberation Army, Navy and Air Force will dominate those areas. And to get through, any vessel, any ship will need the permission of the Politburo in Beijing, not Tokyo. They will no longer be international waterways and airways. And as you mentioned, it would be a devastating blow to the United States prestige that it would not be able to protect any country from the Chinese Communist Party, the fall of Taiwan, that is. By 2040, the United States, and again, this is CSBA, a uh, very good analysis, but also my analysis as well. By 2040, under these circumstances, if, we, if Japan and the U.S., don't get significantly better at countering uh, China's political warfare, then effectively our operational forces are out of Japan. Um, the bases that we had uh, dedicated to U.S. forces Korea and combined forces Korea will now be staging areas for the PLA, uh, basically Bohang, um, Osan, the airfield, uh, the, the ports, places where the, the PLA Navy, PLA Air Force can just stop off, refuel, um, get ready to go on patrols with their Russian allies, treaty allies by that point, because we, we've seen 
what's been going on between Russia and, and China in terms of massive expansion of military exercises, massive expansion of cooperation uh, on the, the defense and security sphere. Well, you can expect that by 2040, there will be a defense treaty between the two of them. And again, that isolates Japan, and that's all part of the of the chain reaction related to Taiwan falling, Chris, that you asked about. So by 2040, is China the regional hegemon, or is it a global hegemon? It's at least the regional hegemon. America is uh, nowhere to be seen. Oceania, uh, which is now basically a, a neo-colonization out of China with massive numbers of, uh, of, of their um, citizens going down to live and actually end up being, in terms of uh, population, some of those island nations, those small island nations, but large ocean nations, if you understand the distinction of the importance of that term, large ocean nations, because their EEZs go out very, very far, and the resources that those island nations command or own uh, are massive, well, they're being colonized by China. China is winning them over, uh, buying them over, uh, as you could argue, it's just happened uh, recently in the uh, Solomon Islands, uh, the repressive, um, draconian uh, repression uh, sponsored or assisted by the PRC is some of the other areas where they're repressing those who are fighting back against Chinese neocolonialism there. Oceania is now basically in the grasp of the PRC, with the U.S. falling back, those Marine Expeditionary Force, um, those what we would call um, a Marine Expeditionary Unit, actually of about 2,000 Marines and a three to five Navy ships that we have routinely patrolling that part of the world, those will be replaced by the PLA Marine Corps and the PLA Navy, and that will be the the routine military force that those specific island nations see. Not the U.S., not the Australians, no one else. That'll be very much dominated. The visibility, the psychological warfare impact of that routine visibility of the PLA will have a tremendous impact on those nations, in addition to the bribery, in addition to the the Belt and Road Initiative, infusion of funds and the debt trap diplomacy related to that. Um, that will have a tremendous impact on Oceania. So looking all around the region, not just Northeast Asia. You're looking at Southeast Asia uh, and vassal states. Already Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, arguably, but the other nations, but uh, Thailand will ultimately abrogate its treaty with the United States. Um, that's the, that's the, the actually quite disturbing vision that I paint in the paper of, of how that region looks by 2040. So Shelley, to round out the answer to you, once China consolidates its hegemony in the Indo-Pacific region, of course it's going to fill its global ambitions. It is the center of the world. It's the, uh, it's, it's the Middle Kingdom. Of course it has to dominate globally. That's the intent. So this is obviously the worst case scenario for 2040. And unfortunately, it's kind of a likely scenario as well. Um, but just in the in the in the scenario uh, you paint in your in in twenty forty, China has become at least the uh, regional hegemon. What can be done to uh, overthrow the Chinese regime's grip on the Indo Pacific in this scenario? In in twenty forty, you mean? Yeah, and like it's worst case scenario twenty forty. Because I want to see like. What what would have to happen if we don't stop it now? What would it take in this scenario to stop it? Game's over in 2040. You Just don't. nothing can be done? At, at that point, it's it's going to be it, it's going to be uh extremely difficult. You never say never, of course. You always want to be bright-eyed and optimistic and and say, you know. Democracy and the, and, the, and the good guys and gals will overcome, but in reality, you know, because what is happening to the Uyghurs, what's a, that, that genocide, that is why they recognize now, finally, we're, we're using the right terminology, it's why they're recognized as genocide, that's the fate of the people of Taiwan, because once 
Taiwan gives in. And in this case, they they just succumb to the political warfare pressure. It's not necessarily an invasion that causes or that allows Beijing to annex Taiwan. Once that happens and the first PLA forces set foot on Taiwan, then you start the internment camps, the kind of what we call concentration camps. Then you, call, you start the reprisals, the retribution, and all those things will be done behind closed doors because no news media organization is going to be in there. It's going to be almost impossible to know what's going on there because of the great wall that China will set up around there. Uh, cyber, uh, media, uh, online media, nothing will penetrate what's going on there, and that will be the case elsewhere. It'll be very difficult to regain our footing and to push back. Can't say it never would happen. Look what happened. Look how the world looked on the morning of December 8th, 1941. We looked out on Pearl Harbor. I live right next to Pearl Harbor, and I can look out where the Arizona is, and I can look out where the Missouri is, is, is birthed. And you know that while you saw on the morning of December 8th, 1941, was smoking hulks of ships and uh, fire still coming from a number of them. And, and the, the U.S. Pacific Fleet, by and large, laying on the bottom of Pearl Harbor. And in Europe, the situation is absolutely horrible. Country after country has fallen to the Nazis. So we've had bleak prospects in the past. It wasn't a little more than four years later that um, the Allies, led by the Americans, we're sailing triumphantly into Tokyo Bay, and we had already taken Berlin, and then the Nazi regime had fallen. But there was hell to pay to get there. And that would be a lot more hell to pay to push the totalitarian, fascist, brutally repressive Chinese regime back after we've fallen back as far as we, I project we will by 2040. So is this inevitable? No, of course not. Um, this is a wake-up call. This is, you know, look, this is an opportunity to get out of our tunnel vision. Um, is this paper is the the chance to, to get out of our day-to-day -day, uh, diplomatic requirements? If you're in State Department, our day-to-day -day, uh, fulfill the, the administrative. Uh, minutia, the uh, administrivia, as we used to call it in DOD, that you're dealing with every day, um, Department of Commerce, Department of Education, and then and the American civil society and Japanese civil society and government, get out of that routine, that rut, and start looking at what the future looks like if we don't better recognize, better detect, better deter, better confront, better, de you know, better learn to how to defeat uh, Chinese political warfare, we can change that dystopian future. We can we can keep it on a fairly level keel. You know, one thing that I found kind of surprising when you you published this paper is the idea that Japan is so vulnerable because I think a lot of people think of Japan, um, you know, as one of the stronger nations in the Indo-Pacific when it comes to being resilient against uh, the Chinese Communist Party. And partly because the CCP has always kind of treated Japan as an enemy. So it would seem that their political warfare tactics wouldn't be as um, easily accepted there as in, for example, South Korea or some other countries that we've seen. But you're saying that it is actually quite vulnerable, right? It is vulnerable. China and Japan go back to their relationship because of people be there. They're right next to each other. Uh, and, and, and so their relationship in conflict, in wars and invasion, it goes back 2,000 years. And so, yes, there's a certain acceptance of certain cultural influence on Japan, which is accepted and appreciated. But there's also an understanding that, um, that China has a very malign attitude in many cases against Japan and the Japanese people. Recent, uh, fairly recent Pew poll shows that about 85% of the Japanese people don't very much like and certainly don't trust China. So the, the Japanese people are, I think, quite wise in this regard, but that, that doesn't mean that they fully appreciate and understand the scope of political warfare 
um, and, and how it works. So it's a, it's a very much a combined arms warfare approach that China takes against every country, the United States, Japan, all our friends and allies. And, and, and the, uh, the means that they use with their, their massive organization, very powerfully resourced political warfare apparatus. And the, the, the top level direction by Xi Jinping himself, his dad was a political warfare officer. He understands how the United Front system works and how valuable it is. You can win everything you want through political warfare. The Japanese people, like the American people, know and understand some of China's malign influence. They don't have a good appreciation of just the breadth and scope and depth of what comprises political warfare, of the war being fought against them on a daily basis. Japanese people don't, American people don't. Japanese elected officials don't, a lot of policymakers don't. Same thing in America. So we're, we're running in, you know, parallel vulnerabilities in this regard. That's why education about political warfare, what you're doing in China, China Unscripted, is so important because you help educate about the, the insidious, malign nature of China's political warfare. So big picture, I guess what we need to understand is what is or what should the U.S. and Japan do to prevent this 2040 scenario you've described? And what is how is the Chinese Communist Party using political warfare to prevent that from happening? Okay, well, let's take your second question first. Let, let's look at what they're doing, and then we can discuss uh, some of the steps that um, the U.S. and Japan. I'm glad you put it that way because neither we we need and Japan needs us alone. Um, you know, it goes back you know to our Revolutionary War concept. You know, we can all hang together. We can hang separately. Uh, better that we stick together. We're a lot stronger. Um, so let's let's parse out for a little while what exactly the political warfare operations are being conducted by by uh, China against Japan, because that, that's that's an essential part of it. A lot of our diplomats and general and flag officers, naval officers, admirals, and, and general officers in uh, the Army, uh, Marine Corps, and, and uh, Air Force. Um, that I've met didn't don't really understand political warfare. Um, the OD officials don't understand what it is. So let's let's parse out some of what's going on against Japan because you, if you if you don't know that you're under attack, you're not going to fight back effectively. You, you, by the time you find out exactly what they did to you, you're in a POW camp. Okay, and that's if you're lucky. If you were one of the ones who lived, then you're you're in a POW camp or you're. You're uh, basically a vassal state again, uh, as I've described many of the countries in Southeast Asia. So let's look at first military intimidation. What it is that China is doing against Japan is massive. The uh, using not just the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, and their incursions and circumnavigation uh, around Japan of uh, of attack air groups and of naval surface groups and of ballistic missile submarines, but also the use of the maritime militia, the gray, those gray zone, uh, very difficult to come, combat because we haven't come up with a good, good strategies, good policies to combat that. The gray zone operations is where they win. They, they never have to go to, to, to conventional warfare. They never have to use all those weapons that they built, those amphibious assault ships, those destroyers, those cruisers that they, they've They've been building at a massive scale where they're going to be double the size of the U.S. Navy. The PLA Navy will be double the size of the U.S. Navy in about now a little less than nine years. Um, uh, real quick, for those listening, can you give a brief explanation of gray zone warfare? Just so they know what you mean. Sure. It's where the top militia comes up and edges out, um, uh, edges out the Japanese fishermen. Well, the maritime militia is basically a militarized force where the Coast Guard, the Chinese Coast Guard, which is a military force in China, comes in and backs up that maritime militia and forcing them out where they uh, where they go into the Senkaku Islands. Which, uh, I go to the, the Chinese have a name for it, but the, the, the Japanese and American name is the Senkakus. Um, China wants them. 
They're they're next on the hit parade after they get Taiwan, maybe before the, the short, sharp war, as they, they've called it, that they're going to conduct to get the Senkakis. Well, that's going to probably start out as a conflict involving the maritime militia or the uh, the so-called fishing fleets. It's, it's going to be civilians from China going in initially because Japan, the U.S., our mentality is, oh, you can't use military forces to block civilians who've occupied the Senkakus. Okay, so those are below the threshold of what the U.S. and Japan would think would require a military response. That's that's the gray zone operations. China knows, as Russia does, and work together. Push as far as you can to the red line that you can expect a military response. And then if you don't see any backbone in Washington, in the State Department, coming out of the White House, then you push beyond the red line and you keep pushing. That's the nature of the CCP. They will keep pushing those gray zone operations until they get ever much, much so much more than they thought they could initially get away with. So hopefully that answers your question in general about gray zone operations. Um, they will um, they'll use their propaganda organs in, in that paper, uh, Japan 2040. I give just some of the recent headlines. They're horrifying. No U.S. Pub- newspaper would publish headlines as threatening as what you see daily in China daily, in PLA daily, in Xinhua, aimed at Japan. But those are daily threats, daily scoldings, daily humiliations of Japan coming out of party state. Chinese Communist Party is the state in China, in, in the People's Republic of, part of China. So what you see coming out on a daily basis through their propaganda organs is, is intense psychological warfare, intense media warfare against Japan. Now, you might say, as some do who I've talked to in the State Department, well, no one really reads that. Yes, they do. Uh, and that it's picked up those articles in Xinhua. Those articles in China Daily, People's Daily, they're picked up and given bounce by international news media, some under the control of the PRC, but just other news media in general will give bounce to those threats, magnifying the intensity of the impact of the psychological warfare. Does that alone win the day? No, but it's all part of a widespread, again, what I call a combined arms attack that over time corrodes confidence corrodes the ability, the will of a people to resist. Um, again, the, the threat of nuclear attack. Recently, we're going to we're going to bomb, we're going to drop atomic bombs on Japan, bomb after bomb until Japan, quote, surrenders again. Um, these threats are terrifying to a nation that has been nuked. If the people of Japan to hear that, it's okay, just give China what they want. OK, that way we won't we won't get nuked again. So, yeah, the, these propaganda organs, this media warfare, this, this strategic psychological warfare uh, does have an impact over time. So, again, this is just some examples of the military, how the military, the, the military intimidation ties into the part of their three warfare, so the strategic psychological operations and then their media warfare. Fear. It's all tied together. Elite capture, you can talk about that if you want. A lot, just like in the United States, uh, the PRC has been pretty successful co-opting, bribing, coercing, enticing with the uh, honey traps, sexual enticement, um, elected officials, business leaders, you know, using blackmail, bribery, coercion, persuasion, all the same tools that they've been so successful co-opting um, a good number of America's elites, uh, they've used pretty successfully over the years in Japan. And Japan has fewer laws against that. It has fewer internal defenses that help them fight against that kind of invasive subversion from the PRC. Again, uh, elite capture um, and goes into the political parties. The LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party, is the overwhelmingly dominant party in Japan right now, but it has a pro-Beijing, a pro-CCP faction in it. The Democratic Party of Japan, which ruled from 2009 to 2012, 
and got into trouble and is no longer in power, in part because it was so obsequious to, to China, it didn't stand up very well to them. Um, again, they have a very pro uh, CCP faction in it. So it's insidious, the infiltration within Japan's elites, the media as well. Um, there is uh, there on Okinawa, which is a key political warfare battleground. Many of the, uh, in fact, all the major news media there have um, either informal or informal relationships with the Jinhua and with other PRC propaganda organs. Imagine that signing agreements with a totalitarian state um, propaganda organ. And, and you're from a democratic country that they want to overthrow. But that's that's the nature of the Okinawa news media. So you mentioned Okinawa. What is the Chinese regime doing with respect to Okinawa? Because I know you'd written about this. Okinawa, uh, we'll get into the, the, the full history here, but Okinawa has the majority of U.S. military forces in Japan. And... Um, there's a, there's a fair amount of, of legitimate resentment because of the fact that so many Okinawans died during the Battle of Okinawa and World War II, the, the one major invasion of, of, uh, uh, on Japanese soil. Um, and so there's, there's some true pacifists on Okinawa. There's some true pacifists in Japan. But in general, there's a lot of faux pacifists. There's a lot of fake pacifists under the guise of pacifism. Uh, radical activists who historically have supported, going back to the Korean War, uh, have supported the Chinese communists uh, when they helped, uh, uh, when they came in and invaded South Korea during the Korean War. Um, you, you've got a very close relationship between those radical activists and the CCP. Um, I based this on a lot of interviews, but also personal experience as a counterintelligence officer in Japan. Um, we, we know that there's a working relationship. We know there's funding lines. We know that there's, there's, other, um, there's other ways that, the, uh, that communist China has supported these groups over the years and worked together. So it is in China's interest to continue to obstruct the use of American military facilities in Japan. The more they can undermine those facilities and, and neighboring community support for those communities, uh, the greater the, the chance is that those facilities cannot be effectively used in a crisis in Asia. Uh, the, the greater the uh, opportunity to close down and remove those installations. Okay, so it's in, it's in Beijing's best interest to do everything they can to obstruct the daily operations of those bases to to try in the long term to get them out of Okinawa uh, and out of Japan in general to destroy the Japan American security alliance. Okay, so take that uh, question, uh, the answer to your question, Matt, a step further. Those radical activist groups, some are legitimate. Some of the people there sincerely believe what they're doing is right. Some are terrorists. And this is something the U.S. government and the Japanese government need to do a lot better job of, of publicizing. They've been reticent, and I know because I've been on the inside of this for over three decades, um, or nearly three decades, put it that way. I mean, Kerry, calling them terrorists is a pretty strong word. What does that mean? You tr well, what would you call it when people who claim to be peaceful protesters trying to pursue um, pacifism uh, – put booby traps in on fence lines on military U.S. military installations. They put, I, I've seen this personally, uh, sharp glass. They, they blew it. They, they cemented on walls. They cemented on, uh, they use razor blades. They, okay, that seems minor, you're saying. Well, what about when they attack the wives and children, school children, going to and from the base? What about when they attack, physically attack, the Okinawan workers on those bases. Well, now we're getting violent. This isn't pacifism. This isn't peaceful protest. These are physical attacks on the, the, the spouses and children of U.S. military personnel in Japan. Okay, go further. How about firing rockets into those bases? They've done that as well into uh, airports in Japan, fired mortars into those bases. 
Okay, how about trying to use devices to include lasers to blind helicopter pilots and uh, fixed-wing aircraft pilots and using devices like balloons that they know will, will get caught in the jet engines of the aircraft, the fighter aircraft, and even the helicopter. They damage the helicopters of what they're sending up in the air. So they will cause an aircraft to crash, which they know is guaranteed to magnify the resentment against American military forces on Okinawa and in Japan in general. He's a terrorist, Matt. So why, like, this is horrible. Why, why is this not something that is talked more about? The reasons I've been given, and again, I, I was inside the belly of the beast for uh, a long time, and I was working at the Strategic Communications Counterintelligence and other levels over the years. And, and the reasons given, the, the State Department people in Tokyo, our State Department, would say, well, it's up to the government of Japan to pursue these issues. Uh, we're there as their guests in, in, in Tokyo. The government of Japan in Tokyo was supposed to ameliorate the issues with the Oak prefectural government. So we'll stay out of it and we won't publicize it. So that's one view that I got. The other was, well, we don't want to be seen as, as attacking uh, protesters. The U.S. military won't publicize this because we don't want to be seen as unmasking and, and, and attacking. We don't want to be seen as a Gestapo coming into uh, as guests in a foreign nation, uh, attacking peace or protesters, whether they're peaceful or not. We don't want to be seen as uh, the ones going after them. Leave that for the government of Japan. Well, that's fine if the government of Japan actually will do that. But in all too many cases, it was just sort of uh, let it go. We'll, you know, we'll talk to them. Uh, but we, you know, very rarely has there been criminal action taken against some of these people. And it's, it's not hard to see them at nighttime coming up and booby trapping the fence line, uh, putting, uh, putting anti-American signs up. And uh, it's a simple example, but this is a daily thing that can damage our sons and daughters, our young 18, 19, 20 year old airmen, uh, Marines, uh, soldiers, uh, sailors, that have to go out there every day and take off these anti-American signs. And then when they go out there, they slice their hands on rusty razor blades and on shards of glass that are adhered to the fence line. And, you know, around the fence line, there's like, oh, the equivalent of almost punji sticks that they have to step on to go out and, and just keep their base looking halfway decent on a daily basis. All this has happened in the past. So I can't I can't give you a legitimate reason why we haven't done a better job of exposing what's been going on. I know there's always a concern as well when you talk to the intel community. Well, we don't want to expose our methods and sources for knowing who's behind this. Um, and, and, and at least we used to know a lot of who was behind these activities. I can't say what the current state of play is over there, but we, we don't want to expose uh, to give away our methods and sources. So we can't really go after these people. So it seems like Chinese political warfare is really death by a thousand cuts. It's it's finding every little place that there's a weakness or a softness and just kind of sticking a knife in there. Yeah, it's a good analogy, death, death by a thousand cuts. It is. It's, it wear, it's designed to wear you down. They, 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 um, they have a massive machinery. They, it's in the millions of people. I mean, this is no exaggeration. The United Front Work Department is massive. The uh, Strategic Support Force, which provides the uh, a lot of the social media warfare capability, the you know what we we think is the 50 Cent Army. A lot of that is uniform military personnel. Um, they provide a lot of the the, the cyber attacks uh, personnel that are involved in the cyber attacks. Uh, we know the names of the units. We know where they're located in many many cases. Um, but it's, it's massive. It's millions and millions of people. It's, it's hundreds of billions of dollars of investment in media warfare platforms. That is entire organizations, global impact organizations of, of broadcast uh, online, again, social media warfare capabilities, uh, print capabilities, buying, coercing, co-opting news media globally to carry the PRC narrative. This is a massive effort. And it, it you start tying in the United Front, the uh, then in in Japan, the All Japan Overseas 
Chinese China Peaceful Reunification Council and uh, the the uh, Japan Overseas Chinese Federation. You start tying in these organizations, which attack, and I use that word advisedly, attack the overseas Chinese, the 800,000 or so overseas Chinese in Japan. And I mean attack, because Xi Jinping has said, it's basically law in the PRC, that if you're Chinese, you're overseas, your duty, your loyalty is to the People's Republic of China. You are Chinese. It's, 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 it's a Sino-fascist interpretation of what it is to be Chinese, but nonetheless, this is the pressure that is brought on overseas Chinese in Japan, in America, elsewhere. And so it's, these are the thousand touch you're alluding to, Chris. It, it comes on many levels. It's not just People's Daily. It's the overseas Chinese news media that is by and large now owned by China in one form or another, controlled or owned by the People's Republic of China. The relentless propaganda that you get through Ryoku Shimpo and, and the other main uh, Okinawan news media that have, uh, in, in not all cases, but in some cases, written agreements with PRC propaganda organs. And these are all part of those thousand cuts, Chris. So you mentioned the Okinawa media being pro-CCP. How do people in Okinawa see China now in the U.S.? Like, is it is Okinawa kind of what's going to happen to the rest of Japan if China continues its political warfare? Okinawa is complicated. Um, the there is a big push. There's a what's called the North South pinch, which is part of PRC strategy in Japan. They're making massive investments, or they were making massive investments in Hokkaido on the northern part of Japan. And then the, the south pinch part was Okinawa, the southwest islands, the Nansei Shoto area. But basically, Shelly, excuse me, you all have your cups of coffee. I have my gin. It's a big cup of gin. It's not. <laughs> I, uh, I don't drink. You know that, Chris? Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, so the, the Okinawan effort is a very sophisticated psyops. Daily messaging, because of again, history, which we don't have time to go into here, the independent Ryukyu kingdom, et cetera, and its tributary status to, uh, to China, as well as eventually to, uh, what is now Japan. Um, there's, there's signs down there. There's posters. Uh, that say you know, to the Okinawan people in Japanese and, and, and in Okinawan, um, we're all part of the same womb. We all come from the same womb, uh, the Chinese people and the Okinawan people. So there, there's a support for uh, the, the largely ineffectual Okinawan in, independence movement, and that's largely ineffectual as of today. But that doesn't mean five years from now, ten years from now, it is ineffectual. We've seen how these, these kind of movements ebb and flow. Um, and especially under the right political and military circumstances. So, again, there's a, there's a lot going on there, a lot of investment buying land next to U.S. military facilities and where the U.S. military facilities are supposed to be located or relocated in the northern part of the island. Um, there's the tourism, uh, which is cut off pretty much now during COVID, but there was a massive effort. Uh, you know how China has weaponized tourism around the world. Uh, so they used it against South Korea to punish South Korea uh, for the THAAD, uh, support for the THAAD, the anti-missile defense capabilities the U.S. wanted to put in there. They've used it against the Pacific Islands uh, to punish them or to force them to, uh, to go uh, recognize uh, the People's Republic of China instead of Taiwan, for example. Uh, and they uh, they certainly were using that and planning to use it even more against Okinawa because a large number of tourists were coming in uh, daily um, into Okinawa. That's sort of on hold right now, but expect if things return to what we used to know, that that tourism weapon will be used much more against uh, Okinawa. The governor capturing the elites, the elected officials down on Okinawa, the governor has made a lot of overtures to China and China has made a lot of overtures to the governor. 
that there's pictures, there's, there's ample evidence, even though there's a lot of denials, of a very close collaboration and uh, interaction between them. So, and previous governors as well have been uh, have been accused of a much too cozy relationship with PRC. So, what's going on in Okinawa right now is, is a very complex combined arms effort to co-opt the people. But there's pushback there. I have a lot of experience there, and I have, uh, I have a, my contacts there tell me that in general, the, the people of Okinawa, like the 85% of those polled by Pew uh, in Japan, don't really like or trust the Chinese much, but they are under pressure different ways, either psychological operations, the media, which isn't necessarily overtly pro-PRC all the time. It is by union dictate, anti-Japan-America Security Alliance, though. It is anti-American, provably, and anti um anti-basis, anti-American basis, of course, in Japan. So what you get is a steady drumbeat, 24-7, 365, of every negative story about American forces in Japan. They, they would tell me when I would sit down over a beer with them, back when I used to have a beer with them, um, the news media representatives would say, hey, we, you know, we might like you personally, but by our union re- rules, we will never write anything good about you. That's propaganda. That's not news reporting. That's that's a, as a matter of policy in your organization, your news organization, you are propagandizing against the Japan America Security Alliance, against the Japanese self-defense forces and against the U.S. military forces. That plays perfectly into Beijing's objectives and requirements. Here's something I'm curious to get your uh, your perspective on. Uh, lately, Japan has been talking about, you know, strengthening its self-defense force in order to combat China, uh, particularly if there is an invasion of Taiwan. Uh, now, I know throughout uh, Asia, there's a lot of uh, anti-Japanese sentiment left over from World War II because Japan did do horrible things in World War II. Uh, however, I'm wondering if the Chinese Communist Party is trying to enhance this anti-Japanese sentiment to put pressure on Japan to prevent them from expanding their self-defense force? Well, yes, you know, that, that's been a, uh, that's been in the playbook for the PRC since, you know, certainly 1949. What China has working against it in this, this narrative, uh, it, it's got, it certainly has history you know, backing it up in a lot of the allegations, what what Japanese forces did was uh, some of the most hideous atrocities one could imagine. Um, but what it has working against it is that for the past 70 plus years, Japan has been the model nation in Asia. It's been the one always out front there helping the others in humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, in terms of economic, uh, quiet economic investment, foreign direct investment in those countries. So there's an immense amount of goodwill um, that is built up in, in some of those countries that were invaded, Indonesia, and uh, uh, invaded by Japan, uh, not necessarily China anymore, because all they hear, all they see in their hyper-nationalized news media uh, and in their, their entertainment uh, industry is hate Japan, hate Japan. Japan has always been uh, evil. Uh, we need to fight them. But, yeah, South Korea it certainly carries some resonance, and that's... Um, you you whole different show whole different program on on South Korea and, and China's influence in South Korea, but uh, South Korea resonates pretty well. But in other countries in Asia that were victims of uh, the, the Japan's uh, Imperial Japanese Army and, and Navy uh, and, and policies during World War II, there's an immense amount of goodwill towards Japan and an increasing awareness that the BRI, that, that a lot of the benefits that China was, was, um, was offering, uh, that it's not what it's cracked up to be within other countries in Asia that were historically were victims of the Japanese in World War II. So in general, you think throughout the Asia Pacific, people understand that uh, the Chinese Communist Party is the bigger risk than Japan building more ships or missiles. I, I think so. I think they, uh, 
people understand that Japan has, has shown massive restraint. And any you know any serious analyst of Japan's capabilities right now will know that it has no power projection capability. There's a lot of again potentially fatal flaws in both the Japan America Security Alliance, or at least some potentially fatal flaws there. And then Japan's ability to project power. It took years. It took how many decades for them to get a very modest uh, amphibious assault brigade in the uh, Japan Ground Self-Defense Force. And that was by sheer force of personality uh, on, on the part of one American Marine officer working with some visionary uh, ground self-defense uh, officers that made that happen. But that that force, um, there there's more people on uh, Tokyo, uh, you know, a Tokyo subway line at rush hour in the morning than the Japan Self-Defense Force has trained and able to go out and recapture one of the Southwest Islands that would be captured by the, that could be captured by the uh, People's Liberation Army Marine Corps. And there, there, there's very few, there's, there's, there's less than several thousand that are even in that brigade. So there's no power projection capability in the, in the uh, Japan Self-Defense Forces and, and the other countries of Asia know that. And they also know the intent and the political constraints uh, of, the, of the civilian government and the, 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 the military leadership in Japan is, is not what it was uh, circa 1939, 1940. So we've talked a bit about um, how the Chinese Communist Party is using political warfare to make the 2040 scenario you described happen. So what can Japan and the U.S. or other allies do to prevent the 2040 scenario from occurring? I always come back to education. Um, the book uh, Political Warfare has been very well received uh, in, in Washington and Congress. Members of Congress, their staffs have, have contacted me uh, about it because they hadn't seen how political warfare was described. But put all together uh, in one book, this, this, describe how it's conducted, all of the ways and means that are used. Are, um, normally in the American government, we tend to to uh, stovepipe aspects of it. The State Department will stovepipe public diplomacy, for example, public affairs, but they won't, uh, they won't necessarily get involved in strategic psychological operations. They, they, uh, they don't, the military is the same way. They'll stovepipe certain aspects of it. Few people have been looking at it um, holistically, uh, the way that we need to look at it uh, so we can fight it effectively. A policymaker, an elected official, if you don't know what the threat is, if you don't know how they're attacking us, it, it's, it's, it's impossible to come up with suitable means to counter it. The education is the first step. So in terms of education, what Japan can do with the United States is, and, 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 and unilaterally, and I stress unilaterally for a reason, is start building education courses for their elected officials, for the members of the diet, um, for those who are in the prime minister's office. What is political warfare? Why is it being waged against us? There is no formal instruction in Japan on that. I deal with, I'm part of a think tank that deals with Japan, U.S., and Taiwan. And it's always an uphill battle from the Japanese uh, perspective for them to even get time um, with the prime minister's office to, to talk about these issues. They're always way too busy with everyday activities. Members of the Diet don't have staffs like American members of Congress. Of Congress, we, we they don't have the people to do the research for the Diet members. So it's hard to get their time and get their attention. Well, they're, 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 Japan has to start doing that or you can't get the proper legislation. Part of how the U.S. can help us to assist with those education efforts, either through a regional center that uh, Japan could post or through better ways of educating uh, across the board in civil society in Japan and uh, through to across their government to include the self-defense forces. The other ways that um, Japan can help itself is study some of our laws, like the Foreign Agents Registration Act, some of the steps that, say, Secretary of State Pompeo took uh, regarding uh, reciprocity in hosting 
uh, Chinese news media, for example. Steps taken to, to control the Confucius Institutes. There's 15 Confucius Institutes in Japan, eight Confucius classrooms. That's, that's a lot by other, uh, other standards in Asia. Um, so the, even though Japan has woken up to the, the, the insidious nature of the Confucius Institutes, as well as some of the, the United Front Work Department uh, friendship organizations and that, they're still effective over there. They, they still play a role in Japan. Japan can crack down even more on them. So they can take, um, they can take some lessons from the U.S. on counter-espionage laws, counter-subversion laws. Doesn't mean America's the model. Recently, inexplicably, our government chose not to prosecute five Chinese spies that lied when they came to the United States to do research, but they were PLA officers, and for political reasons, to I, my guess is to get the meeting that they wanted in China recently, uh, the U.S. dropped charges against these five. So having good laws on the books doesn't help you if you don't have the political will to use those laws. But nonetheless, Japan needs to take some lessons from uh, what we've been able to do in terms of passing laws that can help to constrain PRC political warfare in Japan. And the Quad, obviously, is a big factor in attempting to restrain the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, how do you think that is developing? Well, if we're seeing some high-level meetings now uh, between India, Australia, Japan, and the U.S. that are encouraging. So it, it, we can't expect a NATO-type alliance. We can't expect to go back historically to a Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, CETO-type alliance. What we can expect is working a lot more effectively between the Indians who fully understand the venal nature of the beast that they have uh, neighboring them. They, they've lost a lot of troops uh, to uh, PLA attacks, and they, they understand uh, that they're facing an existential threat, um, and, and they're engaged in kinetic combat, which right now uh, the U.S., Japan, and Australia is not. They're engaged in kinetic com combat and face-to-face -face, uh, confrontations between the Indian Army um, and the uh, PLA uh, on, on several border points right now, uh, contentious confrontations that, that aren't necessarily resulting in bullets flying and knives being uh, run through people's throats. That has happened not too long ago, but it could happen again very quickly. India knows the score. Uh, I've been working with uh, the Chennai Center for Chinese Studies in India, and uh, there's some very, very good people there who can help Japan. Um, in better understanding the nature of the threat that they've been up against uh, for so long and how they're dealing with it. Australia has shown remarkable backbone, remarkable resilience under, uh, under blistering PRC propaganda and economic warfare attacks against it. Uh, Australia can provide moral support and provide uh, mentoring, if you would like, uh, to Japan and, and an exchange of um, expertise on how, how to expose the political warfare. Exposing it's a critically important risk. So let me digress on that for part. Report after report says that uh, Japan's media, even though it's a supposedly free media, the reality is they have a very cozy relationship with the with the elites over there. They won't expose the honey traps that they know about, the, the ones that the, with the Chinese, uh, the, the diet members who are uh, been entrapped, blackmailed uh, by Chinese agents, female agents, um, and sexual enticement. They won't expose a lot of what's been going on with the bribery, coercion, if they know about it to begin with. And again, it's a cozy relationship because they're part of the elites over there. They won't put that in writing, so it's hard to find open source material, people who are dedicated and brave enough because it takes physical courage, not just moral courage, it takes literally physical courage because there's physical 
threats and physical damage that, that has been inflicted upon people who have taken on this challenge. Um, you've got to find people in Japan who are willing to do that. In Australia, and in, 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 in Kate and Marie Brady's case in, in New Zealand, you have gutsy people, smart, gutsy people who have gone out and found this information and exposed it. And that's created a sea change, at least in Australia. New Zealand's still a toss up. But um, so Australia, as part of the Quad, can work with Japan on this. And, and the United States, of course, has a lot of um, a lot of capabilities that can be brought to bear if, again, we have the will and State Department and, and the intelligence and wisdom in the Global Engagement Center and in our Department of Defense. We can do a lot working together. So I guess to wrap up, uh, you presented a very bleak image of the future for 2040. Uh, do you consider yourself to be optimistic that that can be avoided? Of course, I, I wouldn't be here. Uh, wouldn't be here talking with you and Shelley and Matt and discussing the problem so we can uh, better detect, uh, deter, counter and defeat the PRC, if, if I didn't think there, were, there there was a great chance for us being victorious, if I thought we were going to lose, Chris, if I thought we were all doomed, this would really be cheap gin. <laughs> and, and it's not. I'm not depressed. I'm optimistic because I see, again, great feedback. It wasn't just Congress. It was DOD and others that have come back and said we needed a book like uh, Political Warfare um, that helped us to better visualize and understand the threat that we face. And so, again, I, I, I see a turning point being reached. Again, the Japanese people understand there's, there's, there's something seriously wrong with their, their totalitarian, brutally repressive neighbor. Uh, they may not understand how they're being attacked and how effectively they can be subverted, even though they don't necessarily like or trust the Chinese. They can still be defeated by political warfare. Um, they, they, the Chinese can still win. But there's, there's a lot of indicators that people are willing now, much more receptive to learn, especially in this COVID era, where it's quite clear what happened and how the PRC lied, covered up, um, still making a massive propaganda effort to confuse and, and distort the history of what is this COVID uh, Wuhan virus that has killed 4 million plus worldwide. Um, and then watching what happened in Hong Kong, where China lied again, and now has, has, has destroyed what democratic freedoms that, that the Hong Kong people have. And then there are increasingly uh, aggressive uh, threats and, and, and then their murderous uh, intent, frankly, about what they want to do with Taiwan. Um, I think there's an awakening now. People are receptive where they may not have been this receptive to learn maybe even five years ago. So I'm optimistic, Chris. Yeah. If, but we need to start working pretty damn hard and pretty darn quickly. Well, on that point, what can the people watching do? I mean, it's one thing to have the you know, DOD wising up, but if education is important, what can the people watching this do? Get a copy of my book, uh, <laughs> Political Warfare at the Marine Corps University Press. To download it. I'm the only Gershanik who has a book there, so it's easy to, to, to Google it. Get a copy of um, the Center for Security Policy paper, Japan 2040, which was just published uh, last week. It's not a light read. It's, I think, about 30 pages, something like that. It's, it's, it's about 13,000 words. So, you know, you get a, get a good cup of coffee in the morning and go through that and then start talking about it and, and sending out those documents. And uh, there are more and more... There's great organizations. Your organization, of course, is essential to this war and us winning it. So, you know, you all frontline uh, heroes in that, uh, Chris Shelley and Matt. But there are other great organizations, the Project uh, 2049 Institute, Jamestown Foundation, Heritage. They're all doing good work on uh, really good work now, uh, more and more on exposing uh, PRC malign influence in the U.S. against the U.S. and globally. Start looking for articles. New York Times has run some incredibly good pieces. Washington Post has run some incredibly good pieces. Bill Gertz at the Washington Times and, and, and Washington Examiner, has, uh, he, he deserves the Medal of Honor 
for the work that he has done over the years in exposing it, uh, exposing PRC political warfare and, 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 and the military advances they've been making at a times when our own intelligence community was really downplaying and criminally negligent uh, in its downplaying of the advances that the PLA has been making and the, 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 the theft of our technology um, all downplaying it. Bill Gertz has been in the forefront of that. So go to the Washington Times, go to the Washington Examiner. There's there's a gold mine of information there. Get educated and then start taking action. Call your congresswoman, call your congressman, call your senator, write, talk about it with others. That all lays the foundation where the where the American public is ready to, to engage in this existential conflict that will determine what we look like in 2040, not just Japan. It's what will America will be at that point as well that we need to be very seriously concerned with. It's our children that will either benefit or suffer from what we do today in this, this war with the People's Republic of China. Yeah, that's something people don't really th seem to think about too much, but if China does become a regional hegemon in Asia, that's disastrous for the U.S. That's I mean, just just imagine if China had the power to sanction us and like you go to a store and like you see everything that's made in China. Imagine if they just pulled the plug on that. So yeah. this is. And then also if they like control the apps on our phone and that like, you can't even pay for something now because. Or already our medical supply. supply. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a great point. This really does affect what will happen in the U.S. This isn't some far away thing. But Carrie, it's always a pleasure to have you on. We'll put a link to your work below so people can check it out. Um, you know, let's meet up in 2040. And depending on how it goes, we can have a nice tall cup of water or a nice tall cup of gin. <laughs> By 2040, Chris, it's going to be Geritol. <laughs> <laughs> you may be right. And it'll be made in China. <laughs> and we'll drink to that. Made in the United States of America. Yeah. Yes, we're still, so. we're still in Paris. we just have to start really working quite hard right now. A future where the Geritol is American made. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to be a rallying cry. <laughs> <laughs> that's a new slogan of the show. China unscripted made in America. Geritol. We'll work on it. Thanks for joining us, Gary. Please, but that wasn't yeah, that was a lead balloon. Okay, let's <laughs> um, let's look forward to chatting again at some point in the near future. Definitely. You know what I think is really interesting is that what's happening in Okinawa shows how far the the CCP can go with kind of you know using the media, using these kind of radical political groups. Um, what Kerry called them terrorist groups, essentially, and also capitalizing on any weaknesses that you have to turn people against you. For example, you know, he indicated there are actually have been problems with U.S. bases in Okinawa in the past, but then the CCP is able to essentially like weaponize that situation, right? And then using these groups, some of whom have genuine, you know, like grievances or whatever to then achieve the Chinese Communist Party's political aims. It's kind of, it's crazy, actually. Well, for me, what's most surprising about the Okinawa thing is, you know, I'm pretty well educated about China. I have never heard about this issue. Uh, and just how, how that has been swept under the rug so thoroughly. And yeah, it's a perfect example of uh, really how the Chinese Communist Party is, well, as we talked about, like finding these little, like these soft spots that it can apply pressure to achieve its ultimate ends. And I think, you know, it is an awkward situation because the U.S. government feels like they can't say anything about it. And then the Japanese government also doesn't feel like they can say anything about it. Since when did America get a reputation for being polite and not being loud and obnoxious? That's, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a little more sensitive if you have military bases in the country that you're a guest of. I say make America obnoxious again. And also the reason that you have the military bases in that country is because you defeated them in a war and also nuked them. Okay, you make a fair point. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> but, a- but also the, that's the point about how easy it is for China to then take advantage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah, like you, I had not really known about the situation in Okinawa and how it was weaponized by the Chinese Communist Party. And, you know, I'm sure you can see that in a lot of other places as well. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the problem is a lot of people hear about Okinawa and think, oh, Okinawa must be a Pokemon. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Uh, Well, from China's perspective, they got to catch them all. Ooh, Ooh. that is good. Hegemon. (laughs) (laughs) Did we make that joke in an episode? We did. Okay. Yeah, but I I feel like like my joke was the high point and now it's about to go downhill. (laughs) Well, enjoy the fact that your joke was the high point, Matt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, the, like as Carrie says, a lot is at stake. Uh, the 2040 paper, it's really, it is, it is, it's heavy, it's bleak. Um, and it is, it is a possible future that could happen unless people start to wise up to these uh, Chinese political warfare. And the, and the thing is, it like, since it's always in like these like different like little little things that happen, it's like each individually like you wouldn't think, oh, this is this is going to involve China conquering Taiwan and becoming a regional hegemon. It's just like, oh, this is Ch- China has some people on a newspaper in Okinawa. Big deal. Yeah. Or, you know, a lot of these things are happening in such in areas where there just aren't a lot of people who can report on this issue. Mm -hmm. Well, all of the Pacific Island nations thing, that's flying totally under the radar. Right. I mean, who's going to be in Kiribati or, you know, it's not like, like, you know, the New York times is, you know, has a reporter on the ground in the Solomon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I I saw on Twitter, uh, Solomon islands trending on Twitter. Why? Was no, it, it wasn't. Okay. There's was probably jackass coming back. It's <laughs> trending on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to get derailed by talking about the tr- Twitter trending thing and how weird it's gotten. Yeah. But, but, but anyway. the point is, the, the, the important things are not trending on Twitter. Yes. Well, it's just like, or when we were talking about Janice, uh, with Janice last week about Bolivia, right? Like, these are things that people on the ground in those countries know is happening, but like nobody can right, cover they, them all. They just don't have the reporters stationed to do that. So yeah. Uh, well, I guess it leaves it up to people like us. So when that's, are we starting a uh, Japanese language version of China Uncensored? Uh, oh, as, as soon as we find someone who you know loves what we do and is willing to take it on, you know, it's it's not an easy thing to run that channel. So you just basically need a, a viewer to say, hey, this is something I want to do. Actually, that's how we've gotten several of our channel. Our, we have translated China Uncensored into multiple languages, but it's actually usually been a viewer of the show who's come to us and said they want to do that. Yeah. So if you are a Japanese viewer of the show and can uh, do the translation, reach out to us, uh, email us at uh, China Uncensored at gmail.org dot dot com dot com gmail dot com i like the idea of a japanese china uncensored i know we had one for a little bit but yeah that's a great idea all right well thank you for watching china unscripted i'm chris chapel i'm shelly john and i'm matt ganesha we'll talk to you next time maybe in japanese